All right, guys. Well, this is where we left off last time during class. We talked about the seven technological resources. You were supposed to complete an assignment on this. Hopefully, you've uh, turned this in by now and finished it. What we're going to talk about now are how those pertain to what you're building, what you're doing. So let's talk about the people. You create an idea, something that you designed that you're going to have constructed. People, um, we want to talk about create technology. They use products that technology has built, and they service technology. So without people, there is no technology. So all three of these points are very important. They are what you do, where you interact. Information, we think of knowledge, communication, understanding. So information isn't always having a book. Sometimes it's knowing what's in the book, being able to understand what's being presented to you. Information can be moved by telephones, can be moved by letters, mail, internet. There's a lot of ways that we can move information around. Materials. Uh, these come in different states. So let's talk about the raw materials. We think of a raw material as something that's found in nature, often trees come to mind. We, when we look outside, we see dirt, we see plants. I know they don't have dirt on there, but that's important. It's a material. There are different types of dirt, different types of rock, oil, plants, trees. So those are going to be our raw materials. Then we go to processed materials. These are natural resources that have been changed by technology into something more useful, just like uh, lumber from trees or leather from animals. We're still using that material, but it's been cut, it's been tanned, dried, or shaped differently. Manufactured materials. Created when natural resources are altered by the process that do more than change the size or the shape of the material. This is more than just cutting down a tree. Although it has been done before, we don't write our notes on a piece of tree. We write our notes on a piece of paper. But they are made out of pulp from the trees and other materials. Another thing is they are so changed in the form that you can't recognize where they originally came from. So gasoline is one. Uh, glass is another one. The glass we use in our windows. Uh, think of the glass we use in our cars. You can get hit by a rock at 70 miles an hour and it doesn't break. Obviously, it's not the same thing that you would find in a cup that you drink out of. It's been altered. It's been changed over and over and over again in order to achieve a different goal. Another one that we finish with our materials is synthetic materials. This right here. Think of a tire on a car. This originally came from oil out of the ground that was then heated, it was pressurized, and different parts of it were used to make gasoline, to make diesel, to make rubber. And then that rubber is taken and heated, changed, metals add to it. There's a lot of things that are changed in it. Uh, look at this picture right here. Uh, we have plastic chairs, rubber boxes, okay? These are not natural materials. These are, these are things that you won't find anywhere else on the world unless they are made by humans. Um, often it takes uh, scientifically combined chemicals, um, something that you have to work on and understand heat, understand pressure, understand how things change molecularly and how they work together. Um, things that we find are industrial diamonds, man-made rubber, and often plastics. Industrial diamonds, you do find some used for jewelry, but I'm talking about uh, blades, cutting material made out of diamonds. And if you want, you can do some research on that, look it up on your own. Uh, the next section is tools and machines. Tools do this. They increase our ability to do work. Um, a tool becomes a mechanical machine when a power system is added to make the tool work better. And tools and machines increase our ability to do work and perform our jobs better. So think of this wrench. Okay, If you were to take your hands and just uh, try to tighten down a bolt, onto one of your devices, you would notice that there's only a certain amount of force that you can enact on it. But adding the, the wrench itself, it moves your hand out further, gives you leverage, and allows you to increase the amount of torque being used to tighten it. Look right here at this washing machine in the corner. This is merely spinning around or going back and forth. So the washing machine goes back and forth, and the piece on the inside, what's called the agitator, will move your clothing around, hopefully mixing it with the water and the soap to knock your dirt off of it or clean the material. But rather than having to spin it by hand over and over again like you would the wrench, it has a motor and the motor uses electricity 
to clean your clothing. Look right here, we've got a copy machine, uh, we've got a ladder. Of course you could take a pencil or a pen and make a copy of all your paper. Obviously it's easier with a machine to make more copies, to make it faster. Uh, the ladder helps you to climb. Um, you could take a ladder and think of maybe a, a device that lifts you up. Um, in a store, you'll use an escalator. It'd be kind of funny to walk around the mall, and in order to get to the top section of the mall, you had to climb up a ladder to get there. So machines make things easier to accomplish goals. Um, energy. Without energy, our machines do not function. Without energy, our bodies do not function. Uh, you, you've studied enough energy in your science classes. They're the source of power for the machines, and they're the source of power for everything we do. We have food that we eat. We have sunlight that gives most of our energy to our systems. I know that um, our electricity, a lot of our electricity comes from coal power, but think of all your day-to-day -day activities. Every time you pick something up, every time you move something, put something together, you're using energy. That energy you got from food, that food received the energy from the sun and a few other places, but mostly our energy comes from our system, our planet, our sun, and what's around us. Ah, oh, capital. Our guys love capital. That's money. Capital is not just money, though. It's more than money. It's to barter. To barter is to trade something for something else. A lot of you barter with your lunch. I see you, hey, I'll give you a bag of chips if you give me some of your drink, which, of course, that's gross because y'all are sharing germs. So please don't do that. Like Share a chip for a chip. That'd be better. But think of credit cards and property. If you own property, what is it worth? You have capital, you have worth in it. Um, maybe trees, you have a lot of trees there. If not trees, you might have a, a lot of property where you just hunt deer. I know that's pretty popular around this time of year. Time. Let's stop for a second. What is time? Everything takes time. People are paid for work, for the amount of time that they take. And too much or too little time can completely ruin your results. That one right there. Completely ruin your results. If something takes too long to produce, it'll cost too much to make, and you may not be able to sell it. Maybe it doesn't work when it's supposed to. Maybe it doesn't get created in time to meet the need that's there. It's met by something else. Uh, one of the interesting things is the... Uh, the Apple watch that's come out, which is funny because it's a watch and we're talking about time, but the sales were not as high as anticipated. You can look online at the different sales, look around, ask how many people have them, how many people want them, uh, what they're used for, and then think of time. Was it the right time for them to come out? If they'd come out earlier, would it have worked better if they'd waited longer? Time could affect what you're creating, what you're doing. Now we get to another type of system. We had talked about the system originally, inputs and outputs, but this is what's called an open loop system. In it, we are going to use a hot mill for the input process. A microwave combines the resources to heat your food for a certain amount of time. So here we have, look at these different ones. Tools and machines, microwave, raw materials, energy, information, time. So we're going to take time, energy, Tools and machines, of course, raw materials are in there somewhere, mostly in the food. And that's going to become part of this process. Output, obviously, lunch. It is a system that has no way of monitoring or adjusting itself. This is called an open loop system. So if it doesn't monitor itself, it doesn't change anything. Now, don't, don't burn me at the stake here. I know that some microwaves do have systems, but we're assuming that this is just... The cheapest microwave you can go to at Walmart purchase, it has a little knob that turns, you turn it, it stays on one power, and then it turns off after a certain amount of time. That's it. Okay? I'm talking about microwaves with sensors in them because I know they have them. So this is just a simple on and off system, one and zero. Okay. Since you can't control the temperature, only the time the microwave is heating your food, just like I said. All right, let's think of some other systems here. Wood stove. You can throw more wood in, you can take some wood out, you can close it, but for the most part, there's no way to change the temperature of the wood stove. It stays wherever the wood is. If there's more wood burning, it's going to get hot, cold, hot, cold, constantly repeating. All right, train. Right here it says, does the speed remain constant while traveling uphill, downhill, or on a flat? 
Does it? Well, the truth is, just like any other car, when you're going uphill, it's going to take more energy to get it uphill. And when you're going downhill, the gravitational pull is going to increase your speed. So those all pertain to it. And then if it's flat, you can say, well, it's flat. Nothing's going to change. Well, you still have friction. You still have to increase the power and keep the flow of power constant. Although the speed may be constant, the flow of power being used is constant, you are still, if you were to reduce that power, the train would not continue on. You're still having to constantly put something into that loop. Okay, That loop still needs power. And washers and dryers. Let me go back one. Washer and dryer is a one to think about, especially if I've got a dryer right now that's about to go out on me. And sometimes my clothing comes out dry. Sometimes everything's dry except for your blue jeans. You got to hang them up in the end. But the system, it's supposed to be a steady system where everything's put in and it has one temperature for a certain amount of time. Now, once again, there are new washers and dryers that monitor the amount of moisture and change the amount of heat used. But for most of us, our dryer is a turn on, turn off, and push a little button. Okay, And that will dry most clothing, but not everything equal. It's just an open loop system. All right, let's talk about differences in these systems. Furnace. Temperature is controlled by setting a thermostat at a desired level. Bicycle. Rider watches the road and just pedaling or braking. These are changed. This one right here is changed by a device that senses the temperature. It will either kick on the heat or kick on the air conditioning, depending on what you need. Bicycle, you pedal faster, you go faster. You slam on your brakes, you might wreck, but you'll slow down. Cars, speedometer. Of course, we all know that your parents probably don't keep it at 55. We're talking a little closer up to around here, right? Some of you are like, uh-huh, Mr. Allen, it's going way up to there, but I'm going, no, 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 we'll just call it 70. All right, driver looks at the speedometer, um, and they decide, am I going fast enough? Am I going too fast? Um, obviously, in this car, um, you would not be going too fast. But I'm just saying, driving around in your Corvette might be uh, a little faster than 90 miles an hour. So let's talk about a closed-loop system. All right, input going 30 miles an hour. A car combines the resources to move the car and transport the riders. So output, the car speed is 50 miles per hour. All right, combining these. Let's talk about it. You monitor the car. So the driver sees the car is going too fast and we have a loop. So the combination of the speedometer, the driver's eyes, and the driver's brain form a feedback loop. You're supposed to be going 30 miles an hour. Everything combines together to have an output of 50. You monitor that, see that the car is going too fast, and then goes back down. Next step, okay? Driver compares actual speed to the desired speed. Driver presses the brake or accelerator, so you either give it brake or gas. If you need to speed up, you speed up, then you check the output again. Are you going faster or are you going slower? push the brake pedal, you go slower, then you monitor it one more time. Open or closed loop system. You tell me. Look at these. We have um, a couple different things here. Yes, the one in the middle is a clock. Although it kind of looks like a scale, that's actually a clock. Top right, dishwasher. Uh, bottom right side, fictitious robot. Left side, uh, we're looking at a radio. And then a stop sign or stop light. Which of these is open and which of these is closed? So, guys, when you can, get back to me. I want you to take these pictures and write out which one you think is open, which one you think is closed, and we're going to discuss it in class tomorrow. Thanks, and I'll see you in the morning.